Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Motu booth here at NAMM 2013. My name is Dave, but I'm here right now to talk about Digital Performer version 8. This is our flagship audio MIDI sequencing software. And uh, first thing to tell you about DP8 was it just won the Electronic Musician Magazine Editor's Choice Award for 2013. And one of the comments they made was, this dog goes to 11. Best digital audio workstation chosen by Electronic Musician Magazine. So why? What is so cool about Digital Performer? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the new features that are in DP8. We announced DP8 at the NAMM 2012 show a year ago. We shipped later in the year. And between the time that we announced DP8 and the time that we shipped, we added a bunch of new features in there. So let's go take a look. All right, now we're looking at Digital Performer, and we see that we have a single window. If you use multiple monitors in your studio setup, you can split the windows of Digital Performer in any combination you like. Digital Performer has the most flexible user interface of any DAW on the market. So we can work with a single window. We can split the windows out if we like. Let's go up to the Digital Performer menu and go to Preferences. And let's check out something called Themes. We can change the look of the program. With a single mouse click, we can change how Digital Performer looks. And you can customize this yourself. If you want to go in and change the colors or the icons inside Digital Performer, you make the program look exactly the way that you want it to look. Let's go back to, uh, that's a cool look. Oh, uh, I like this one. Deluxe, nice wood grain look there. All right, now you'll notice that uh, we have the control bar as part of this consolidated window. And I can switch between different windows very easily with these tabs here. So everything's happening inside one window. Let's uh, go split that control bar out. So if we want the control bar to be its own separate window, we can do that. Let's bring it back in as part of the consolidated window. But let's compact the height. We'll make it smaller. As a matter of fact, we can hide or show whatever we want to see on the screen. So maybe you're using Digital Performer just for live processing. You're not even recording or playing anything back. You can hide all the transport controls. You can simplify this interface as much as you need to. Let's go take a look in our sequence editor. We see we've got some waveforms happening here. Let's see what we can do for the, uh, the waveform colors. Full control over the customization of the colors. When you're spending six or eight hours in front of the computer, this all makes a difference. Set up the program to look and work the way that you want to, to work. All right, now we'll get back into DP and we'll go over to our mixing board. We see we've got our faders, we've got our solo, mute, record, and input monitor buttons, effect sends. We can have up to 20 effect sends per fader. Then we've got our effects inserts, and we can have up to 20 effects inserts per track. And look what happens when I click on an effect insert. I get this window, and this is called the effect chooser. And look, look at all the plugins I've got. These are all of the plugins that are currently loaded. And mostly what I've got in here are the stock Motu plugins. DP8 ships with over 70 plugins. 70 high quality audio plugins, but I've also got all my Waves plugins in here. So look at this incredible list. And this is just two different companies worth of plugins. Well, I think three, because if I look under the category of manufacturer, there's the Apple plugins. Oh, yeah, I've got Altiverb, so there's my Audio Ease plugins, my Stock Motu plugins. And what I can do is I can start building categories. I can have favorites. So we can go from having literally a thousand plugins available to having those plugins organized so they're instantly available. I want to see the last five plugins that I used. I want to see all my EQ plugins. I want to see just my Waves plugins. So this is a very effective way of organizing plugins inside DP. All right, while we're talking about plugins, let's do something only an audio engineer could love. Let's listen to a kick drum. OK, so what I've got here is I've got a multi-track recording of drums. I've got kick, snare, and there's my two TomTom -tom tracks. And then I've got my overheads. And I'm sending the overheads through a stereo bus. This is a pretty standard way of recording a drum set. Put close mics on all the drums, and then set up some overhead mics. 
The problem is that the overhead mics are picking up the same thing that the close mics are. So you've got a microphone right on the snare drum, and then you've got another microphone four feet, seven feet, ten feet away that is picking up the cymbals, but is also picking up the snare drum. So now you have a phasing problem with the snare drum. And what a lot of engineers will do is they'll go in, this was really difficult to do with analog tape, but they'll go in and they'll take their overhead mics and they'll move the audio tracks to phase align uh, things like the snare drum and so forth. Well, I've got an easier way to do that. We've got a plug-in here called the Precision Delay, and that's what this plug-in does. It is a delay plug-in, but it will also advance the audio. So we can delay the audio, or we can advance the audio, and we can do it in real time as the track is playing. So I've got this Precision Delay plug-in, which is set up to work in stereo, on the drum overhead microphones. I can play the track back and I can move the time offset of those microphones, which is really the equivalent of going into the studio and moving the microphones closer or further away from the drum set. So right now there's no offset, but I'm going to advance by six milliseconds. So those overhead drum mics were about six feet away from the drum set. By advancing them by six milliseconds, now the timing of those overheads is almost exactly in the same place as the spot mics. And I'll make some obvious differences so you can really hear. Further delay. And then as we bring those overheads into the pocket, the whole sound tightens up. Now what you're supposed to do when you're using overhead mics on a drum set is you're supposed to use a tape measure and measure from the snare drum to one overhead, snare drum to the other overhead, make sure they're the same distance so you have the same phasing between the overhead mics. If you haven't done that correctly, you have independent control over the left and the right here. Let's uh, look at another way of using this precision delay. I've got a guitar track. <laughs> This guitar track is actually a stereo track, and I've got a trim plug in here, and I'll pan those mics left and right. So what's happening here, the way that this guitar track ended up being stereo is that two microphones were placed on the guitar cabinet. In a lot of circumstances, you might put those two microphones on separate mono tracks, but for whatever reason, the stupid audio engineer recorded them into uh, stereo. That's cool and everything, except are those microphones exactly the same distance away from the guitar amp? If they're not, we're going to have phasing problems. And those phasing problems are going to be really obvious if we mono the guitar tracks up. All right, so now we have the combined two microphones in the center. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in my precision EQ. And what's happening here is we have one microphone on the guitar track on, on this side, the other microphone here. And the plugin can now compare the two microphones to see if they're in phase with each other. Not only can it compare the mics, but it can do an automatic alignment. That alignment is not based on transients, it's based on the phase of the waveform. So we've got a phase scope here, and if that line is straight up and down, it tells us that the two signals are in phase with each other. Listen to the difference it makes as I change the phase. So what I'm doing is the equivalent of walking out into the recording room and having the engineer move that microphone backwards and forwards. And you know, that's what you tell the assistant engineer to do. You say, it's up to you to wear earplugs. Go out there, Carlos Santana's getting ready to play. I know it's gonna be loud. And you move the mic until I say it's good. Another way we can do it is we can move the mics in real time inside the track. So that's our precision delay. Some pretty tweaky stuff here, but this is high-end audio engineering tools. Let me show you another example of uh, uh, some of the cool new plugins shipping in D DP8. This is a stereo audio track. This is a mixed track, but it is not yet mastered. Big stereo uh, tambourine there. Has no 
Okay, so we're listening to a stereo mix, and I brought in a plugin. This plugin is called the Spatial Maximizer. So far, the Spatial Maximizer is not doing anything. We're going to have some fun with the Spatial Maximizer, but let me explain what this does. <coughs> There's a, a concept called mid-side. If you think about a stereo signal, you think about left and right. So you think about, okay, I need two channels to carry my stereo signal. One channel for left, one channel for right. But there's another way to carry a stereo signal over two channels. You can take the stereo signal and derive just the mono content. We'll call that the mid-band. We'll send that on one channel, and then we can take the, what's just on the left and just on the right, all right? Information that is only on the left side of the mix, information that's only on the right, and that can be carried on a sideband channel. So I said to the engineer, how can we get left and right on a single channel? He says, well, you have negative and positive waveform. So with mid-side encoding, the mid-channel is the mono content of the audio, and the sideband is the left-only and the right-only content. So what this plugin is doing is it's taking that stereo mix and it's encoding it into a mid-band and a sideband. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to solo the mid-band. So this means we're only going to listen to the mono content of the audio. Anything we hear here is information that is in both the left and right speakers, mono. Time. All right, and there's the lead vocal. Now this is a typical pop mix. The lead vocal is mixed to the center of the mix. Now let's solo just the sideband. So now we're going to hear only the content that is specific to the left, only the content that is specific to the right. No mono content. And the vocal comes in. Except it doesn't, because there's no mono content. We've taken the mono content out, and that included the lead vocal. All right, now we got the background vocals, they'll come in. But just the, the content that is specific to left and right. All right, so now you see how mid-side encoding works. Now we can process the mono content independent of the stereo content. All right, so this mix was uh, uh, produced by the singer, which means he mixed his voice back. That's the way that happens. The singer does the mix, he says, my voice is too loud. So the mastering engineer gets a two-track mix, and he's got to make the vocal louder. How can he do that? By bringing up the mid-band. We'll do that with an equalizer. Or we could drop it out. Now let's go down to the sideband and increase the high frequency on just the left and right. And this is our spatial enhancement. So we decide how much mono content, how much stereo content, and each of these frequency controls in the equalizer has a compressor. So we can compress individual frequencies that are specific to the mono or the stereo content. There's so much more we can do with this. In the sideband, let's go back and solo that sideband again, we have a high pass filter. So right now this is full bandwidth. Or we can just get rid of all the bass content altogether and we can set what that cutoff frequency is. Why would we want to do that? Well, let's say that we're mastering for vinyl. All right. The way a vinyl record works is the needle goes up and down, that's the mid-band. Needle goes side to side, that's the side-band. If you have a lot of bass content that is only in the left or only in the right, it pops the needle out of the groove. So when mastering for vinyl is done, what they have to do is they have to remove bass content that is only left or only right. Okay, so not a lot of us are mastering for vinyl these days. How about something a bit more practical? How about we're making MP3s? I would say everybody here who does any kind of audio engineering, their music ends up on some sort of compression format. The way these compression formats uh, work is they look for common source material in the signal. And if you have a lot of information, that low frequency information that's only on the left or only on the right, the compression algorithm is working really hard to try and preserve that, and the top frequencies suffer. So if you clean up the bass junk out of the sideband, when you compress to MP3 or some other format, you're going to get a better sounding audio because the compression algorithm is not fighting with low frequency junk on, on the left or the right. We also have a, a bass enhancer for the mid-band. So whether you want to use this as a special effect, we'll put it on our stereo background vocal mix to drop the center out so the lead vocal has a space to sit, 
or maybe we're going to use this as a mastering tool. This is the spatial maximizer inside DP. Okay, do you guys feel like you're at a science lesson here? Well, I got one more thing to show you in, in this demonstration. We're just going to have some fun with this. Digital Performer is used for three basic jobs. Digital Performer is used for film scoring. We're going to see James Sizemore come up at uh, 1230. He's going to show us how The Hobbit was scored in Digital Performer. Digital Performer is used in the studio for sound production. I've just shown you a couple of our really slick plugins in DP8. But the third place the Digital Performer is used is for live production, whether it's recording or playback. So did you ever wonder what it was like to be in the band Motley Crue? I'm sure you did. What would, what would it be like to be Tommy Lee, right? What we have here, this is the show file for Motley Crue. Here, let me, I'm, I'm sort of getting out of sync here. Let me show you. There's all these people that use Digital Performer Live. In the last year, U2, Madonna, the Roger Waters, Wall Tour, all use Digital Performer for live playback. Maybe, uh, maybe it's audio that's being played back. In the case of U2, it's some background vocals and some extra percussion parts. But almost uh, all of these artists are using click tracks so that they have consistent tempo. But the computer can do so much more than just play back audio tracks. It can play back MIDI to send patch change messages out to the guitar rig. It can uh, generate time code that's used to control a lighting rig or video. Uh, MIDI or time code can be used to trigger pyrotechnics. So these big, sophisticated shows like the, the Roger Waters Wall Show, the whole show is being run by Digital Performer. Take a look at this list of bands. Aerosmith, Chicago, Korn, Fuel. What do all these bands have in common? This particular group of bands has two things in common. They all use Digital Performer for playback, and they all use systems made by a company called Playback Control that is uh, in partnership with a gentleman named Viggy Vignola. See that great big gray box over there? That is the Motley Crue Road Rack. Viggy has been working for Motley Crue for about 17 years. He started off working for Whitney Houston. All right, Whitney Houston, oh, we're probably talking 25 years ago, they were using, the, the Whitney Houston band was using Performer and that Digital Performer. So Viggy has been using Digital Performer for over 25 years, and Viggy builds these rigs. And people like Lee Lofnane from Chicago say, it's enhanced our show. Or Tommy Lee from Motley Crue says, uh, it's bulletproof, and when you're working with computers, that's saying a lot. Tommy Lee is savvy with computers, but he doesn't want to think about computers when he's on stage hitting his drums, and he doesn't have to because these are bulletproof systems. What they do is they make either a single computer system or a double computer system for redundant playback. All right, now I'm going to show you the file and show you how it works. So this is the Motley Crue show file that Viggy Vignola has given to us to use, and let's take a look at these, uh, these tracks. First track is a MIDI track, and that sends out a patch change message that goes out to the guitar player's rig so that he's got all of his right sounds. So when they're bringing up the next song, the guitar player doesn't have to run over to his floorboard and hit all the right pedals. It's just programmed. Bring up the song, the guitar goes to the right sound. The next track that we see is called Tone, and this is a one kilohertz sine wave. And this signal is sent into a piece of equipment called a radial switcher. The radial switcher has two sets of inputs and one set of outputs. So we have two computers in the road rig, and both computers are running simultaneously, and they're both sending tone into the switcher. If the switcher n notices that tone has stopped, one of the computers stopped, the switcher automatically switches to the B system. So if one of the computers goes down, the engineer doesn't even have to do anything. The system automatically switches to the B system. Then we have click tracks. We have slate tracks. We have additional audio tracks, some, uh, some uh, backup vocals, some sound effects, and so forth. And all these different tracks can be routed to different destinations. The click tracks aren't going to go out to the audience, obviously. They're going to go to the musicians in the band. But the additional sound effects and extra audio, that may go out. Well, it's definitely going to go out to the audience. may go to the band as well. So uh, if you're in Motley Crue, You've ever wondered what it's like to uh, get the right track here? That would help. You ever wonder what it's like to stand on stage in front of 60,000 people playing loud guitar? Well, this is what it, would, uh, what, it, what it would sound like if you were in Motley Crue. Shout at the devil. One, two, one, two, three, four. Synchronized pyrotechnics, all being controlled by a digital performer. One. Lights, two, video, the whole bit. One, two, three, four. So we're hearing what the musicians hear. They probably hear a little bit of leakage off the stage as well. Now let's hear what the audience hears. Yeah. 
And if, in case you're wondering, no, Vince Neil is not lip syncing. But we'll give him a little help on the chorus. And again, you see the pyro going on, everything going in sync. So whether it's the lights, the video, the backing tracks, the click tracks, digital performers running the whole show. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up at 12.30, we have uh, James Sizemore. He's going to show you how The Hobbit was scored in Digital Performer. Thank you very much for spending 25 minutes with me. My name's Dave. We're Motu. Have a great show. Thank you very much.